Hi, we're here today with Judge Edward J. Bradley, Court Hello. of Common Pleas, and uh, of the First Judicial District of Pennsylvania. Judge, thank you very much for being here today. I'm very glad to be here, Len. It's important since you were a president judge of this jurisdiction for so long, a record setter, I guess. But uh, before we get to that, can you take us back to your early life, uh, where you were born and grew up and that sort of thing? Sure. I was born in 1928 in a section of the city called Port Richmond uh -huh. and in a parish called St. Anne's. I was a Catholic and that's where our family belonged to that parish mm -hmm. and that's where I went to school, St. Anne's Parochial School as they were all called yeah, right. in those days. Sure. And I went there for eight grades, mm -hmm. graduated in 1942 and then I entered St. Joe's Prep Yeah. All right. and uh, I went to St. Joe's Prep from 1942 and graduated in 1946. All right, great. After, Go ahead. After that, I went to the uh, University of Pennsylvania. Uh -huh. uh, I went to the Wharton School where I majored in accounting. Uh -huh. And following that, uh, in 1950, I entered the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Law School, all right. Now, did you complete that school? I mean, I think you had some military service. Well, no, I, I, I went straight through three years. I graduated in June okay. of 1953. Uh -huh. And upon my graduation at that time, the uh, Korean War was still on, although it was winding down. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you were in school, you, and it was a draft, yeah. if you were in school, you could complete your schooling. Uh, I but see. when you did, right. you became subject to the draft. Right. Okay. And I and many of my classmates who, ha who hadn't already served in World War II, yeah. some had, but those that hadn't were subject to the draft, mm -hmm. and, and I was. Uh, so uh, I was able to take an examination and get admitted to the officer candidate school oh, of the Navy. Yeah. And uh, I was actually called up to active duty later that year, about November. Uh -huh. And I went to the Officer Candidate School, which was in Newport, Rhode Island. Okay. And uh, that was about a four-month course. And in early 1954, I was commissioned as an ensign. Oh, good. And assigned to a ship. Oh, yeah. And okay. That's where I was stationed for the course of my three years, huh. three and a half years in the Navy. Oh, no kidding. That's great. Working on a ship? On a ship, yes. Yeah. Um, and then... Uh, Following your your service uh, to the Navy, then what happened? Did you get married? Right well, away? I was mar I got married while I was in the Navy in I 1955. Uh -huh. And interestingly, uh, our ship had mostly gone into the uh, Caribbean. Uh -huh. That's where we sailed. It was okay. nice. That was nice duty. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> I was married in November of 1955, uh -huh. and two months after that, we were sent over to the uh, Mediterranean. Oh. There was something going on there at the time called the uh, Suez Crisis. Oh, right. And they, the Navy decided to beef up the Sixth Fleet, uh -huh. which patrolled the Mediterranean. I see. So they sent our ship over there. It was what was called an amphibious force flagship. Mm -hmm. It would be the command, command ship of an amphibious force. force. Yeah. So we were sent over to the Mediterranean and sailed up and down there wherever there was a hot spot for the next 10 months. Okay. Now, I have to say, I never heard any shots fired in anger. All right. But uh, that's what we did. Okay. And uh, we come home, and I guess in October of uh -huh. that year, 1956. Okay. And uh, we stayed, my wife then came down again to uh, Norfolk, where our ship was oh. stationed, and we stayed there until I was discharged early in 1957. Uh-huh. And then we came back here to Philadelphia, Philadelphia and settled down in the Overbrook section. All right. And, uh, and uh, uh, I know Overbrook uh, has been a, a popular uh, neighborhood for uh, a, I know some other judges that I've interviewed and, and now yourself and uh, other people working for the city. It's a nice neighborhood over there, isn't it? And yeah. At that time, there were a number of judges living in the area. Judge. Yeah. Judge Klein, the senior Judge Klein, uh -huh. who was the uh, president judge of the Orphan's Court, oh, right. going yeah. back into antiquity yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to, to people today. Uh, he lived in that neighborhood. Uh, judge Ken Scheuer lived in that neighborhood. Judge Vince Carroll, uh -huh. who, lived, who right. was the first president, president judge, judge of the Consolidated Courts, mm -hmm. he lived in that neighborhood. Okay. To name a few that I can think of right. off the top of my right. head. Right. You're doing better than I am on the memory. <laughs> um, 
it, when when you uh, began your practice of law, uh, what? How did you start that? And well, I was I was in, had been admitted to the bar, mm -hmm. so I was a lawyer. Yeah, uh, a good friend of mine and neighbor was uh, Tom Masterson, uh -huh. and he lived in the neighborhood. Yeah, and he knew I was interested in finding work. He was a deputy city solicitor. Oh. in charge of what's called the Claims Division of the City Solicitor's Office. Uh -huh. Basically, it was a division that handled the trial work. Uh -huh. okay. And th through, through him, uh, I applied for a position and uh, uh, got accepted there. Good. And I ended up in his division, the Claims Division. Uh -huh. And he was uh, a mentor to me for a number of years. And that's where I got some my first trial experience. I see. And these would be cases where the city was being sued? City, yeah, basically, the city was being sued very often because people fell in potholes in the street. Oh, right. It was said to be the city's responsibility to have fixed that pothole. Okay. Or even if it was a sidewalk, the city was secondarily liable to the homeowner. Oh, right. Okay. And if the homeowner couldn't pay, the city would have to pay that verdict. So oh, we I handled see. those. Uh, there were automobile accidents that various city vehicles oh, right. might get involved in from yeah. time to time. Yeah. We would handle them. I never thought and of that. There, were, there was other types of litigation, mm -hmm. but that was the staple of it, I, yeah. I think you might say. Now, um, you mentioned Mr. Masterson, but um, were there any other personalities, <clears throat> pardon me, in the practice of law here or, or nationally or any judges who you might have looked up to or tried to emulate or thought of as, as... Well, I'd like to say first off, my brother, who was eight years older than me, uh -huh. he went to Penn Law School. Oh, okay. he entered He entered in 1941, but his mm -hmm. education there was interrupted by World War II, right. and he, where he served in the Navy, and then when he came back, he graduated from the law school in 1947. Okay. And he graduated first in his class, he was editor-in-chief of the Law Review, yeah. and I always used to say that he forgot more law than I ever, <laughs> I ever knew. Yeah. So he was somebody that was a... Yeah. And a matter of fact, he started teaching at the law school the year oh. I started as a student. And did you get any well, classes? Well, I, I would have been in first year, I would have been in his class because they were divided alphabetically and he had the A to M <laughs> section, but they moved me into the other section so I wouldn't be taught by my brother in my first okay, year. Okay, okay. But in third year, he was the only one teaching estate tax, and I took estate tax. I don't oh, know whether it was a required course, but yeah. it was a course that I opted to take, so he was my professor. Now, they had something called the anonymous marking system. Yeah. Uh, you would put a number on your paper, so when the professor marked it, he would oh. not know whose paper he was marking. Yeah. And uh, so he wouldn't be in any way swayed by classroom performance or yeah. any either favoritism or antagonism developed in class. He wouldn't know whose paper it was. And the front office would then supply the name yeah. of the paper. Yeah. And they even had a secretary copy my paper over in longhand so he wouldn't recognize, recognize my you. handwriting. <laughs> Well, it happened I got my lowest mark in law school from him, <laughs> to which he said, no wonder you always used to cut my class. <laughs> but, uh, so in any event, he, yeah. was, he was one of my okay. uh, people Early. that I looked up to yeah. as a lawyer. That's great. And, uh, Tom Masterson, as I've indicated, was right. another one. Yeah. And Tom's father, James Masterson, yeah. was at that time considered quite quite properly to one of the top trial lawyers in the city of Philadelphia. Oh, okay. And at some point Tom asked me, because even if you were in the city solicitor's office, you could still have a private practice. Okay. Now you had to put your hours in in the city solicitor's right. office or regular work day, nine to five. Yeah. But you could go to that office earlier or later uh -huh. and handle matters. And he right. asked me to come over there, mm -hmm. which I did. Good. So his father was a was a mentor to me, and someone yeah. that I watched trying cases uh -huh. and assisted with to some extent. That's great. Uh, That's really were, something. They were some of the early ones that I. Uh, also, it sounds like you might have been pretty busy around that time, working nine to five, and then also. Yes. Doing some, yeah. Well, um, how did you end up becoming a judge? Was that? Well, I was in the city solicitor's office. Right. From 1957, when I got out of the navy until I became a judge, and as I said, I was also doing some work on the side in the Jim Masterson's office, yeah. I eventually became a deputy 
City Solar Center, which met, I was in charge of a division with a number of assistants under me, uh -huh. and we handled all of the eminent domain work all right. uh, for the city, that division. It was called the Counseling Division because, amongst other things, we wrote all of the city solicitor's opinions, oh, or at okay. least drafted them. The city solicitor himself might sign the right. most formal and important of those, uh -huh. but uh, we drafted all of those, wow. did the eminent domain work and all the bond and contract work. Yeah. Legal work in the city. So uh, I, I had quite a varied, as I said before that, I was in the litigation division. Yeah. So I had that experience too. Well, in 1965, for the first time in, well, in 1964, three judges had been added to the Common Pleas Court. Uh -huh. And in those days, and many people, even lawyers today, may not remember it, in Philadelphia you had seven up until 1964, you had seven common pleas courts, numbers one through seven. Uh -huh. Each one had three judges, a president judge and two other judges. Oh, okay. And they each one operated independently Separately, as yes. its own little fiefdom. Okay. And then in, <clears throat> and that had been so time out of mind. Right. And then in 1964, CP, common pleas number eight, was created. Uh-huh. And that meant there were 24 common pleas judges, and then in 1965, it was agreed that there would be two more, common pleas nine, okay. and common pleas ten. Now, Philadelphia at that point politically was democratic, Yeah. but the governor was Bill Scranton, yeah. the elder Bill Scranton. He right. had a son who I, I might have been later been governor, but he was in politics, but right. this was Bill Scranton Sr., senior, right. and he was a Republican. <clears throat> So it was agreed that uh, CP9 would be, you might say, the Republican court. I got you. CP10 would be the Democratic court. Uh, and then when they would be appointed, it was agreed that they, all six would have to run for election in November of that year. Okay. And that the, the parties would cross support them. I see. Because judges could cross file right. and run on both tickets. Yeah. And it was agreed that those six would be supported by both parties. All right. Uh, and the governor said that he would accept recommendations from the party chairman, uh -huh. quite frankly. But he also imposed the condition that the Bar Association, the Philadelphia Bar Association, right. had to approve anybody that was submitted. Okay. And if they didn't okay. approve them, he wouldn't appoint them. Mm -hmm. And so the Bar Association knew, and they had to bid in their teeth and they really went to work. Yeah. And there were any number of people who, uh, and they had a very rigorous uh, selection process. And they still had do. To, and they do <laughs> now, but yeah. this, this was the, the model of it. Yes. You had to submit a about 20-page questionnaire outlining your whole legal career and a lot yeah. of other things. And then you had an interview uh -huh. by the committee. It was called the Judiciary Committee of the Bar Association. And then they voted whether they would recommend you to the governor or not. Yeah. And there were a number of people whose names had initially been put forward yeah. who were not recommended, not recommended. and didn't make it. Uh, my name was put forward. I was known to the uh, then city chairman, Frank Smith, uh -huh. and I was one of the names put forward, and I managed to clear that formidable <laughs> barrier, right. and I was appointed on Common Pleas number 10. Okay. Common Pleas number 9 was Don Jamison. Oh, right. Okay. He, he was to be the president judge of that court, because exactly. each one had its president judge, yeah. Stanley Greenberg, and Jim McDermott, uh -huh. who later became a Supreme Court Justice. Justice right. Common Pleas number 10 was uh, Herb Levin, uh -huh. uh, Tom Reed, who had been a ranking uh, assistant or deputy district attorney, oh, and right. myself. Good. Okay. We were number not number ten. Number ten. So that's the way I got on the bench. I remember in part of my work I've done some looking at historical photos of courtrooms and I remember seeing at the bottom of certain courtrooms it would say common pleas court number two mm -hmm. or common pleas court number three or whatever. And I didn't never quite understood that until you explained it right. just now. So that's and each one had its own now that was a problem, of course because nobody was keeping track of the overall, overall picture. Right. What's happening to the backlog? Mm -hmm. How many, how long is it taking to try civil cases? Mm -hmm. What's happening on the criminal side? Because right. each one was its own, was its own uh, entity. Right. 
And when cases were filed by a wheel, I think, uh -huh. they were assigned to one of the courts. A wheel would be spun, and this uh, okay. case would go to number one, this case would go to number seven, and so forth. I see. But nobody was keeping track of the whole picture. Mm, right. Litigation began to increase, and there were each, each one of those numbered courts was building up Quite a, a considerable bit. backlog. Yeah, I see. Both civilly and criminally, and that was one of the problems. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the reasons that there was a constitutional amendment in 1968. 68, right, okay. And what, what that constitutional amendment did was to consolidate all of those ten common police courts uh -huh. into the common police, one common police court. Right. But it did With the invasion. In other words, there were 30 of them. Wow. 30, at that point, number 10. No, I was not court number 10, the last numbered court. Yeah. So there were 30 judges. Oh, I see, right. Then you had a county court. That was a separate court of 20 judges which handled juvenile, juvenile. matters, domestic matters, and so forth. Right. They became part of the common police court as the family court division. Right. And okay. you had an orphan's court of six judges which handled the states and wills. Mm -hmm. uh, they became common pleas court, uh, orphans court, court division. division. So you now had a court of 30 judges in the trial division. Uh -huh. They were the former number one to common ten. Pleas, right. Uh, you had 20 judges in the family court division and six in the orphans court division, a total of 56 okay. judges. And that's the way it was from 1968 on. Now it was at that point but even before that, the idea of the backlog had started to come to light. Yeah. And the Supreme Court, in the, I guess, early 60s, before the Constitutional Amendment, mm -hmm. and before I was appointed to the court, made Judge Carroll, they called him the court administrator, and they gave him certain authority uh -huh. to oversee all the business seven area. courts and then eight courts and, and uh, ten courts. I see. He was now he didn't have unlimited power that the president judge later had, but he did have some power to try to centralize things a little bit yeah. and try to get a handle uh -huh. on the caseload. Right. And uh, but then you had the amendment in 1968, which consolidated them and created a president judge right. okay. to be elected by the other judges, and Carroll yeah. was elected uh -huh. as the first president judge. Okay. Now he was a very unique individual. He was a very domineering, dominant. Oh, really? type of, of man, uh -huh. which is one reason the Supreme Court made him court administrator. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so he was the natural selection for president judge, and the, the judges all voted him into, uh, okay. into that office. Right, okay. And uh, uh, it's, it's very interesting. If you've ever stood up to him on an issue yeah. and handled yourself well in doing it, yeah. you earned his respect. Okay. He would treat you with respect after that. If yes. you back down, uh -huh. and let him roll over you, whatever it was he wanted to do. Forget about it. You would be his doormat yeah. from then on. Okay. So it was important to do that. <laughs> well, it's, just, it's good to know, too. Yeah. I mean, uh, but if, and I, I think that's usually the way to deal with certain domineering mm -hmm. people, you know. You have to uh, let yourself be known. And, yeah, stay well, I, I, and I had occasion to do that. I won't go into the reason. Okay. It's, it's a long story. Yeah. Some things I don't want to discuss. All right. I had occasion to stand up to him in yeah. a very direct way yeah. when I hadn't been on the bench more than a couple of years. Yeah. And uh, he respected me after well, that. I'll tell you what, I've never thought of you as being a very shy person, to tell you the truth. No, but, I don't think I was shy. No. But uh, then eventually, after all the courts are consolidated, you're a judge for how long before you were... Well, I, <clears throat> I said I was appointed in 1965 right. and then elected, as I've indicated, we had the Same stand year. election that November, yeah. we were appointed in August, and that was a 10-year term. And after that, after the first 10-year term, where you had to run on a party label, or in the case of a judge, you could cross-file, right. but you still had to run on a party on a label, party right. Democrat, Republican, on both tickets. Okay. Once you were elected for 10 years, yeah. the next time you ran it was for retention. Right. And you didn't run on a party label, you ran out of a separate space on the ballot, uh -huh. shall the following judges be, be retained, retained for a 10-year term, yeah. and they were listed in order, yes, no. and yes or no. Yeah. And that's how, that's how it went. Well, I was elected in 65, and due to be uh, stand for retention in 
75. Uh -huh. But the, as I say, Judge Carroll was the initial president judge. Uh -huh. He became ill after a couple of years. I'm not quite sure how many, how long it was, but he became ill and he stepped down I as see. president judge and he died shortly thereafter. Uh -huh. But an election was held for his successor in, I suppose, the early 70s, maybe 1970, I'm not sure when, but Don Jamison, right. who went on the bench with me, but he was president judge of the original Common Pleas number nine, he became the president judge. Okay. And uh, he served in that capacity until 19th, April of 1975. Now, the, there, there's politics involved, sure. of course, and for years, the city had been Republican mm -hmm. up until 1950 or 51. Yeah. The city had been For Republican. 40 years or so, right? The city had been Republican. And um, so the judges were all from the Republican persuasion, you mm -hmm. might say, which is why Carroll was elected. He mm -hmm. was a Republican. And even why Jamison was elected. Because the majority of the judges, it was 19, were still yeah. Republican. Republican. But in 1971, 25 new judges were appointed for Philadelphia, common police court judges, okay. bringing our complement up to 81. It's a huge number of judges. And, yes, and the, the governor at that time was Milton Schapp, a mm -hmm. Democrat. Uh -huh. Philadelphia was a Democratic city, yep. so the majority of those judges were Democrats. Okay. And, and I think Jamison sensed that uh, and, and in those days the judge could succeed himself for another five-year term. President Judge. Yes. yes. President Judge could succeed himself. And I think Jamison sensed that he would not be re-elected uh -huh. as President Judge. And I remember speaking to him about it. And <laughs> okay. He said, no, I'll be re-elected. And I said, well, <laughs> <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> but I'm thinking of somebody else, <laughs> if you know who I mean. <laughs> right. A guy named Bradley. <laughs> well, in any event, his, his good friend, John Bunting, became the president of the first Pennsylvania bank, uh -huh. which at that time was, I guess, the biggest financial institution around here. Yeah. And he offered Don a very excellent position uh -huh. with the bank, vice president, I think, in charge of public affairs or uh -huh. public and legal affairs. Yeah. And I think Don also being a little wary of whether he could be reelected <laughs> yeah. in 75 uh, or whenever he had to run 76. He took the, He stepped off the bench mm -hmm. and took that job in April, so that uh, an election was held right. in April of '75. Okay. Now at that time, the election of the president judge was supposed to take place in even-numbered years, in early January, after any new judges who were elected right. in the odd-numbered years, which right. is when judges ran, right. would have taken the bench, so that the new judges would have a voice in electing and the uh, president, president judge. judge yeah. But since Don stepped down in April of 75, there had to be an election to, right. for Replace. President Judge. Yeah. And there was a question initially whether I would have to run again or there would be another election for President Judge in January of 76. Oh, I see. Yeah. And that was the initial lay of the land. Right. But uh, myself, I think I might have had some hand in stimulating it, okay. and some other judges filed a petition with the Supreme Court saying it was important to the court because so. the whole consolidated court system was still a pretty new thing. Yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, even though it had been in existence maybe the consolidation seven years or so, mm -hmm. uh, that there be uninterrupted leadership right. and not Continuity. a lot of Right. Uh, things going on, who's going to be the next president judge. Right away, that, especially. That my term should be for five years. Yes. And the Supreme Court agreed. Yeah. So my term, my initial term, was for five years. Well, it's logical. Too. Yes. Yeah. Until April of uh, 1980. Uh-huh. And, of course, that was an even-numbered years. Yeah. And April was after the new judges had taken her office, so there was Back another the election right in April of 80, and I was re-elected. Uh-huh. And in... Uh, 85, we had the April thing again. Yeah. And the Supreme Court said, listen, you have got to get back on track with all of the other common police courts that elect their own president judge. Right. So your election this time, Bradley, mm -hmm. is only until January of 1986. Oh. Okay. So I ran right. from April, and then there was another election. 
in 86. And I was re-elected again. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then that ran until January of 91. Right. And at some point before that, the Supreme Court decided, uh, and, and throughout the state, president judges could be re-elected to succeed themselves. Uh -huh. And that happened. Uh, it happened in Delaware County where uh, uh, Franny Catania yeah. was the president judge paralleling my uh, yeah, we terms. Were speaking about it. Uh, but they ruled, they decided that from then that point on, a president judge could only serve one five-year term. Okay. He could, he could, after that, he would have to step down, and five years later, he could run again. Yeah. But uh, you could only serve one, you cannot serve consecutive terms. So that ended my 15 year As president uh, reign, <laughs> right, if you will, right. or term. I, and I, as I said, when I began working here in 72, I always knew of you as the president judge because you were, right. for the you know, 15 years or so that I was aware of the position. Um, well, what happened after that? Well, after that, I went back to sitting on the bench, took my regular mm -hmm. turn. I, uh, what kind of cases? Well, I sat, I sat on both civil and criminal, mm -hmm. but I think primarily I sat in criminal court. And um, then after that, there was created a court where it had already was in existence. Uh, I think it was called, the title of it, not very impressive, Miscellaneous Division or Miscellaneous <laughs> Court. Yeah. But what it handled was all appeals from administrative agencies. Oh. From the Liquor Control Board, from the, uh, the traffic, uh -huh. uh, when licenses were suspended, right. any kind of uh, administrative agency appeal, from uh, zoning appeals from the zoning board, yeah. all of those appeals from administrative agency were centralized in one court called the Miscellaneous Court, okay. because it handled, it handled miscellaneous, miscellaneous matters. matters. And uh, I was made the... Uh, Miscellaneous court judge. Congratulations. <laughs> it was very interesting because you handled different types of problems sure. every day, different yeah, courts that. and so forth. <laughs> and uh, that's what I did then until uh, I reached the age of 70 in uh, May of 1998 mm -hmm. and would have had to become a senior judge. Yeah. Uh, I opted not to do that, okay. not to sit as a senior judge. and. Uh, Looking at the reasons, when I was president judge, we needed senior judges. We needed their services. Yeah. And uh, uh, I did everything I could to encourage judges, senior ju judges who became 70, to sit yeah, as sure. a senior judge. Yeah, I know. They disposed uh, of a lot of matter. If they were willing to serve 10 months a year, yeah. full-time 10 months a year, they would keep their office, their chambers. I see. They would keep their staff. Uh-huh. And all the other uh, things that yeah. a regular sitting Rigger. judge would have. Yeah. And uh, by the time I became a senior judge, that wasn't the case anymore. Okay. They didn't need them as much. Yeah. And you would immediately uh, perhaps be relocated to a different chamber, maybe right. less desirable. Yes. You would not have your staff any longer. Uh, you would have a... Uh, draw from a pool. Secretarial You would not pool, have yeah. secretarial pool. You would not have your own law clerk. You would not have your own personal court officer, which every judge yeah. had at that yeah. point. Right. Uh, and I didn't care for that very much. Okay. And I opted not to sit as a uh, senior. senior judge. I yeah. didn't think that they were accorded the uh, proper respect. Uh, respect they should have. So yeah. I didn't sit as a senior judge mm -hmm. and haven't sat as a judge. All right. Uh, since 1998. Now you've told us in this history, you've explained a, a lot of differences in how the court was organized and how the court was run. Uh, and I wonder is, have you found a lot of differences in the way law was practiced back when you first began to practice the law to compare to today or? Well, um, of course, there's been uh, law firms have now become gargantuan. Yes. Uh, I remember Hundreds in those days, Tom Masterson, about whom I spoke earlier, uh, he was offered a position with Morgan Lewis and Bacchius. Uh -huh. A very good position. I don't know whether they were making him a partner immediately or not, but yeah, he would right. become a partner very soon. Uh -huh. And at that time, I remember he would have been the 67th lawyer. 
with Morgan Lewis Bacchus. Okay. And I remember somebody, maybe I, said to him, when it hits 70, sell. But <laughs> in any event, he was the 67th, and uh, that was considered a huge firm. Yeah. Well, now they have thousands of lawyers <laughs> right. worldwide. Right. I don't know how many they have in Philadelphia. I, I can tell you it's more than 70. Uh, hundreds, yeah. And uh, <laughs> same way with a lot of other firms. Uh -huh. So those firms have grown large. But we wouldn't see the impact of that so much in our court because those firms dealt mostly in business matters, uh -huh. uh, things that would not get into the common police court. All right. Uh, so I don't know that I can say I've seen a difference in the uh, practice of the law. Mm -hmm. uh, you always have the feeling, and it may be nostalgia, that uh, things were a little more collegial yeah. in those days. The lawyers were closer to each other, uh, knew each other, and so forth. Um, whether that's just as I say, nostalgia, or whether it's the fact or okay. not. But that's a feeling I have, and I suppose most other lawyers of my vintage might might have that feeling. The others have but expressed uh, uh, similar yeah. feelings. Yeah. But other than that, I haven't noticed differences in the, up until 98 at least, I hadn't noticed differences in the way law is practiced in cases are heard now. There right. are all kinds of administrative uh, things that are done. Sure. We, we instituted some of them ourselves and during my day we yeah. instituted the individual judge calendar program in civil cases okay. to give judges who were assigned to civil cases their own individual calendar which they became responsible for uh -huh. from beginning to end. All right. uh, so we instituted that and something like that may be carried on today, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we instituted a number of other uh, reforms which are still in existence. For example, uh, when I first went on the bench and until I became president judge, jurors were called for a three-week period of service. Really? Yes. And they might never sit on a case. Yeah. They'll be called. They would be challenged for one reason or another. They'd go back to the jury assembly room. And so, so it went. Yeah. But you had to serve. If it was initially three, and I think they might have reduced it to two. Of course, if you were in a case, you stayed for as long as the case. Right. But certain jurors were just not going to be picked as jurors for whatever the reason might be. Yeah. Lawyers would sense something. Okay. And um, so I instituted, or was with the help of a lot of others on the court, something called the one day, one ju one trial right. system of jury service. Okay. That was put in while I was president judge. So you were called for jury duty if you were not selected as a juror. That was it. You went home. Good. If you were, you served for the balance of that case right. that you were picked for. Then you went home. Yeah. And so that's that was a, a big a big thing. Up and we were uh, we were one of the early courts to adopt it. Uh huh. But there were others that had done it. I think it's and become we were universal. The, we were the first one that did it without any federal grant money uh -huh. or without any increase of money from the city. All right. We we did it with our existing. Yeah. resources and put it into effect. That's great. And it was a, it was a big thing. Sure. Uh, another thing that, uh, that we did was uh, establish an arbitration center. Up until we did that, lawyers would hear the arbitration cases in their own office. Okay. So there was a, a lot of difference. Yes. Whose office you went to. Right. right. So we established an arbitration center and yep. the lawyers who were the arbitrators came to the center to and would sit panel. and hear three cases. Yeah. And, uh, now that's still thriving today. And that still does, yeah. Yes. We, we did that. Now, I also, we, we pushed to raise the limit of arbitration to $20,000. It had okay. been about five, I think. Yeah. Today it might be 50, I'm not sure. I think, I think it is 50. Yes. But we, we got it raised to 20. Uh -huh. So that was, a, that was another thing that, uh, that we did. Uh, we we uh, increased computerization too. Now, that had started under Don. Uh -huh. Jamison, Jamison. Um, but we really pushed it. We, we, I brought on board, or he might have brought on board, I'm not sure, uh, but uh, his name was Bill Fisher, and he was, yeah, a, I remember he was a computer whiz, yeah. and he was instrumental in computerizing the, uh, the court system. And another thing that we, we put into effect, that we couldn't have done it without the uh, extensive computerization, was sentencing guidelines, uh -huh. because at that time, uh, Crime was a big issue, as it always is. But sure. In, in, at that particular time, it was, there was a lot of publicity about it, and particularly about sentencing. Mm -hmm. uh, some thought sentences were too not severe enough. Right. Some thought they were too severe, 
and also that there was disparity. If you got in front of Judge A, you would get this sentence, five to ten years, the same type of case in front of Judge B, you might get one to two years. Yeah. So there right. was, that was a problem. Uh, now, I could not impose sentencing guidelines. I didn't have the authority no. to do that. But, but what I did was we studied through the computers the way judges were actually sentencing. And we didn't just take robbery because there can be all kinds of robberies. Right. Uh, it could be a purse snatch, which would be the, the least offensive type of robbery, you might yeah. say, where there could be at gunpoint. Yeah. There could be physical injury done to the person. Right. The same way with almost any crime you can think of. But also there were differences in defendants. Sure. Somebody had no record. Somebody had a record as long as your arm. Yeah. Uh, somebody had a job to go to. Somebody didn't. We classified. We were able to extract all those factors uh -huh. and set up various categories of cases under each crime heading. But a, a robbery by purse snatch, right. a robbery by physical Mm -hmm. force a robbery with a, a weapon, a knife, right. or a gun. Yeah. Uh, we did that with every crime. We did that with the victims, with the uh, uh, offender's record, whether he had a past okay. record, whether he had a family that he could go to, whether he had a job he could go to, all of those things. Right. And then we found out how judges were actually sentencing in those precise situations. Categories, yeah. And, uh, we showed what, let's say, the average might be. But those uh, were then set up as voluntary guidelines so that when you were sentencing, you could find out, I by push the computer button, right. what other judges in your court, you know, the Court of Common Pleas in right, Philadelphia, right. were doing with that precisely the kind of case and precisely the kind of defendant Defendant's, that yeah. you were dealing with. Yeah. So that you would not maybe go off the deep end, either, you know, if you were thinking of a sentence, you would say, wait a minute. Either way. Uh, that's way more than other judges have given, or that's yeah. not as much as what other judges were given. Yeah. And the hope was that this would tend to eliminate sentencing disparity. Right. And they were called voluntary guidelines. And later, they, what our program here, which as I say, we could not have done without a very sophisticated computer system. Yeah. Uh, those, our guidelines were eventually uh, the model for the state's adopted, adopted uh, uh, mandatory guidelines. Yeah. And they, they came to us, or, you know, how did, what did you do? How did you yeah. do it? Let's see what you did. <laughs> and they based a lot of it on what, what we were doing. That's correct. And another thing that we did with the electronic stuff and computerization was um, uh, closed circuit telev televised arraignments. So uh -huh. that instead of a magistrate, or not a magistrate, a municipal court judge, yes. having to go around to a district where the guy was arrested right. uh, and hear it and arraign him, or instead of having the defendant brought somewhere, uh, yeah. he would be arraigned by television in the district where he was arrested. But the judge the, and where be. the police officer who arrested him was assigned. Right. But the judge would be at the police administration building, okay. and he would hear it that way. Yeah. So that meant the judge didn't have to travel and you only needed one judge at a time. Yeah. And the defendants did not have to be transported and the police did not have Huge to leave savings their there. district. Yeah. And that again was a product of our saved a lot computerization of money. and so forth. It's still going so, on today uh, too. Yeah, right. So uh, the judge in the That's criminal justice to, system. And, and I, uh, what I like to say, I'm talking we did or I did. Nobody ever does anything worthwhile or lasting by themselves, and I didn't. Okay. I was very fortunate to have uh, good administrative people, uh -huh. including you, Len, in yeah. the, in the uh, family court division, but excellent uh, administrative judges, Frank Montemuro, who was the administrative sure. judge of the family, family. division, right. until he went on to the, superior, the appellate court superior, I think. Right. Uh, uh, Charlie Meraki, who was uh, always my opponent in president judge elections, yeah. but he was the administrative judge of the trial division oh. and did an excellent job. He was a hard worker, yeah. dedicated guy. Yeah. And, um, and a nice Ed, guy. Ed so. Powellick as the yeah, administrative judge court. of the Orphans Court. Uh -huh. And of course, succeeding Frank were Nick Cipriani uh, and uh, Jerry Z Jerome, Judge Jerome Zaleski. Zaleski, right. So I always had their help, and Dave Savitt who was my first court administrator. Yeah, I uh, remember and, him. And so. we went way back, we went to law school together. Yeah. And uh, 
So I was very happy that he was on the bench when I became president sure. judge and agreed to serve as court administrator. That's correct. And they were all very that good. That worked out really and well. And so when I say, if I say I did something, yeah. we did something. Yeah. And, well, uh, I think you said we most of the time. And, and so. One of the other things we did and uh, uh, was to work on the new criminal justice center. Uh -huh. And uh, I, I always used to say back in those days that uh, uh, building a courthouse is no sport for the uh, short-winded or the faint of heart. Right. <laughs> because it wasn't. Because that was one of the things that I, and mainly Harry Takeoff, he was he succeeded Dave Savitt as the court, as administrator. court administrator. Yeah. One of the things that we worked on was trying to get the new courthouse built. Uh -huh. the, well, what's now the Criminal Justice Center. Right. And we Very worked on that for you know, years and years. And a big help by the way, was Councilman uh, David, uh, David Cohen. Cohen, yeah. He was, he was really helpful in getting things move, moving in city council. He's the father of uh, Judge Dennis, Dennis Cohen. Cohen. Yeah. yeah, but he was, he was very helpful. And eventually, we did have the groundbreaking while I was still president judge <laughs> for the okay. Criminal Justice Center. Yeah, I still have a, a picture at home with the shovels <laughs> yeah. and hats, sure. which they would say do for the groundbreaking. The court, the building wasn't actually completed until after I was no longer president judge. Right. But since we had the groundbreaking, I and my team <laughs> take yeah. some credit for that. You were there. Sure you can. Yeah. So, uh, Took a lot to move that. up to that point and, of uh, And we did, the, as I mentioned, the backlogs in criminal and civil cases in the 80s. We reduced the, uh, the civil case backlog by about 20 uh, percent and the criminal case backlog by, by more than that, 25 to Mm -hmm. Thirty percent, and there was there was a study done under the aegis of the United States Justice Department oh, yeah. and the uh, the uh, the Center for uh, National, National Center. Center for State Courts. Right. And under their aegis, they did a study of I guess various courts throughout the the country, and um, they compared us with Allegheny County, which included Pittsburgh, which was right. the only county in Pennsylvania comparable to us, yeah. and with San Diego, California, okay. which was comparable in size and was considered a well-run court system. Yeah. And as it turned out, we ran things at less of a cost per case than either of those counties, and with slightly less staffing levels, huh. and our judges' caseloads were 25 to 30 percent higher, higher than either of those jurisdictions. Yeah. So, uh, and eventually the National Center called the civil yeah. trial court the best in the nation. More recently, yes. Yes. Yeah. So uh, those are some things that, uh, that, that we did. I think, uh, you, I think you and your partners, your colleagues, did a great job. And I say we were, a lot of it was breaking new ground. Sure. And, and Don Jamison did a lot of that. Yeah. Uh, Carol had to pull everything together. Right. And he was probably the, the right guy at the time to do that. To do that because he was very, as I said, domineering, yeah. dictatorial type of guy. But uh, in those days, some of those judges, I can remember when I went on the bench, hadn't been consolidated yet, but Carol was called the court administrator yeah. and was running things. And one of the judges says, I don't know, I've been sitting in the same... This was a judge who was already over 70. In those yeah. days, you didn't have to retire at 70. Yeah. I've been sitting in the same courtroom for 30 years and then Carol changes me to <laughs> and I thought, what's wrong with that you know <laughs> but that's was a built-in mentality for right, all those that years time, of those yeah. courts being their own right separate uh, sure empire yeah you got and the, so Carol was the right there, guy stay there for Carol 30, was yeah. the right guy initially to yeah. bang some heads and pull together <clears throat> and Don did a did a good job in a lot of the groundbreaking stuff and I, and and I we were still say. dealing with groundbreaking matters sure. Yeah, uh, that for most of my, not for okay. all of my 15 years, but for a yeah, lot of it. Yeah, I agree. A lot of it. I was, um, I'm, and I want to say thank you very much, Judge, for coming here today. And not only that, for, for all the things <clears throat> that you've done, that you've accomplished, and the way you've done them through the years. Well, I appreciate that very much, Len, but as, I, as I've said, uh, and I, I uh, received something called the Justinian Society Lifetime yeah. Achievement Award last year, uh, which I was very happy to, very pleased with, because I am a member of the Justinian Society, which is the Italian lawyers, right. and I'm also a member of the Breheim Society, yeah. because my father was Irish and my mother was Italian.
Okay. Uh, in fact, she was. My mother was born in Italy. Yeah. And she was a war bride from World War One. Okay. Mom, she was in the Navy and stationed in Rome, and that's where they got married. So you got to be a member of the Brihan and, and, and just, just yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm a member of the friendly Sons of Saint Patrick and okay. of the uh, Sons of Italy. Yeah. Uh, well, you were the were the ma uh, were you the grand I was, master. Well, I'm, I was the grand marshal of the Saint Patrick's yeah, Day Parade, okay. and I'm, I'm a member of the board of the Saint Patrick's Day Parade. Yeah. Uh, but uh, and I'm also I was also knighted by the Italian government. Oh uh, yeah. They call that cavaliere, cavaliere ufficiale, which means official uh -huh. knight or cavalier. Yeah. Because I'm half half Italian. Oh yeah. So uh, I'm very very proud of that. But uh, as I said Thanks at the time of the Justinian up. Award, yeah. and I think I might have said a little earlier, uh, nobody does anything worthwhile by themselves. By themselves. And uh, I certainly, and that's particularly true of me. Well, you've done a lot. Uh, but anyway. We appreciate it. Judge Edward J. Bradley, thank you very much, okay. Judge, for thank coming you. here today.